Hello, I'm Patrick from Pluto Press, and welcome today's event with Francois Verges in what is the second in our event series, What We Need to Do Next, where each event confronts some of the burning issues affecting the world right now, from why world sucks and to ending carceral feminism. Each discussion will give you the grounding in the subject at hand and provide the tools you need to join the struggle. Before I hand you over to Misha for full press, and welcome today's event with Francois Vergens. What is the second in our event series? What we need to do now. Sorry. Before I hand you over to Misha for the full introductions to our speakers, I just wanted to let you know that you can get twenty percent off Francois's book from our website. Just visit plutobooks.com and use the discount code Next Twenty at the checkout. That's plutobooks.com and N E X T Twenty at the checkout. There is also three further events in this series featuring Sahima Manzer Khan, Ilyas Nagdi, Tansy E. Hoskins, and more. And you can sign up to these events at plutopress.eventbrights.com. Now over to you, Misha. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you to everyone joining us tonight. And also thank you to Pluto for posting us tonight. I'm Misha Fraser Carroll, I'm a writer living in London, and this evening I'm really excited to be talking to Francoise Vergès about ending carceral feminism. Francoise is an activist and public educator. She holds a PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, and is the author of many books, including A Decolonial Feminism and A Feminist Theory of Violence and Wombs of Women. Francois's book, A Decolonial Feminism, grapples with the central issues in feminist debates today, from Eurocentrism and whiteness to power, inclusion and exclusion. Delving into feminist and anti-racist histories, the book also assesses contemporary activism, movements and struggles, including Me Too and the Women's Strike. In her book, A Feminist Theory of Violence, Francoise denounces the carceral turn in the fight against sexism. By focusing on violent men, she says that we fail to question the sources of their violence. And just a note on the structure this evening. So I'm going to be asking Francoise questions for the first half an hour, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. So please, as we're speaking, just pop your questions in the chat um, when they come to you and we'll try to get to them. So without further ado, I want to ask you Francoise, as you say, ideas around violence focus on violent men. Um, but as we try to move away from this idea that violence kind of spontaneously emerges from individuals, where should we locate the sources of gender violence, gendered violence instead? Well, thank you. Good evening to all. And uh, thank you for a very generous introduction, Misha. Uh, well, uh, of course, you know, all these uh, recent years we have heard uh, uh, about uh, more I mean, we have heard more than ever about femicide and other form of violence. And, uh, but I was really concerned with the call for more prison, more punishment, more laws of protection uh, in a world that is of permanent war, of absolutely systemic violence everywhere that we see through the climate disaster, the poverty, impoverishment that we saw also through the pandemic, which is not, in fact, uh, the wars around the world and I, I felt the need really to say something to that feminism to this feminist to those feminists who absolutely ask for more punishment and more severe uh, you know punishment and the source for me I, I'm not saying that there is no violence outside but I do say that uh, capitalism and racism are inevitably violent they cannot survive or they cannot exercise their donation without constant violence. And we can see an incredible, you know, long history of century of violence imposed on peoples uh, of color and, and, you know, through slavery, colonial slavery, colonialism and imperialism, and today again, imperialism and colonialism. And you know, violence within society. It was for me one one aspect of you know one answer to your question, and the second one was also the what is offered to men in that society, what is to become a man in that you know society, what is a model in racial capitalism, and the model is a man that can exercise a domination through violence. That is that to become a man is to be to show your capacity 
to uh, rape, torture, maim, murder, you know, and kill. So this is uh, what, how that violence uh, for centuries now has been a form, I mean, where has been, I mean, has been created. And then the word of peace and the word of protection have been entirely captured by the state to in fact uh, make that, uh, you know, permanent war possible under the mask of peace and protection. Definitely. And you've kind of spoken to this a bit already, but for anyone who's not familiar, would you be able to define what do you see carceral feminism as being and where does it emerge from? Yes, uh, carceral feminism has a long history. Uh, uh, <clears throat> in fact, it, I mean, I, I will say there are, you know, uh, many answers to that. First is this idea of protection, you know, like women need to be protected and that that protection has to be given to the state and therefore to the police and to the army and to the tribunal and therefore to the, you know, that the prison. That there, there is a, the, this idea. And, and by taking women as victim and men as essentially, you know, like the, the two community, two binary, I mean, a binary cut, men are, you know, the perpetrator and the women are the victims. So therefore, all the men have to be called to protect the women who are constantly victims. And this, of course, did not intersect with class, with race, with different, you know, forms of domination and exclusion, the fact that men are not all men. I mean, there are differences among men in the world. I mean, of skin color, of, you know, origin, of religion. I mean, we see it with Islamophobia today. And so there, you know, so, and women are not also, you know, just uh, one group. Uh, I, you know, for instance, the question of violence, I, I remind in the book, I mean, uh, that uh, white women uh, would not have rights in uh, 17th, 18th century, so what, what are called civic rights, had the right to own a human being because they could be slave owner and, you know, also at the head of plantation, but also that they knew very well, uh, you know, they, they participated very well in the market of human. So that was a violence and they, had, they were not afraid, white women, to go to the market and to bargain and to buy. And they understood that this uh, human being were capital in their end, you know, that capital that they could have then after sell or, you know, borrow against. So that form of violence, you know, that they were not foreign to that. They were not at all. And uh, they could, have, of course, punish. So the, the fact that women would be on the side of uh, peace and you know passivity and men, it's for me totally contrary to that history of uh, racism and capitalism. And cultural feminism is in, in a way uh, associated with this question of keeping some form of domination and supremacy. By I, because if you say that men are perpetrator and women are victims, Team, and you ignore the question of class and race and religion and gender, you can effectively then uh, say, you know, that you, you can ignore or marginalize the fact that the men who would be sent to prison would be poor, black, you know, uh, Arab, Asian, I mean, non-white. And you can ignore that fact and you can effectively say that we want to protect uh, the woman. And through this, so the notion of protection in carceral feminism is in, in fact a protection that women uh, resist uh, and uh, in a way uh, sexist and, and of course uh, class, uh, class base. Uh, it's uh, it's, uh, fem it's carceral feminism want to ignore absolutely also the struggle against uh, the prison even if of women, the fact that, you know, a lot of women also are sent to prison, not only men, and they are usually poor women or women of color or one woman. And for, and that the criminalization of, of uh, men and women of, of, of color also is usually even young people are treated as adult, you know, young black, young Arab, and, uh, and whether girls or, or, or boys are treated as adult. So cultural feminism is really a class-based uh, racial uh, form of you know, uh, defense of, of prison. Yeah, and you speak to kind of that loss of childhood or who is afforded a childhood, who's not given a childhood in your most recent book. And I think you also really speak to that complexity really well in the book, you know, the idea that 
there are many different types of feminisms as well. And there's a kind of split between the global north and the global south kind of types of feminism. And I was wondering, why do you think it is that feminism in the global north, or at least mainstream feminism, is so carceral? Why is it so drawn to kind of these binaries that you're it, talking about? It's a feminism that has uh, absolutely stood boldly wanted to ignore its own history. You know, I mean, there is a narrative that uh, feminism was, uh, you know, uh, emerged in uh, in Europe, and of course, the word feminism emerged in, in you know in the French language. But the, the fact of struggling, you know, fighting for, uh, for emancipation, liberation emerged. Uh, that uh, the Europe was a natural soil uh, for the idea of freedom and equality, and uh, and uh, you know, and emancipation. Of course, this is absolutely false. But so the, that feminism has never wanted to look at its own history. I mean, how come that feminism would have been, you know, protected? I mean, would have women innocent uh, from the century in which, you know, Europe built itself as a superior, you know, to all the civilization at this, you know, uh, then during uh, colonialism in the 19th century, the civilizing mission or the Weizmann burden in, uh, you know, in England. I mean, how feminism would have remained, you know, totally innocent of that, would have not, this idea, this rational idea wouldn't have penetrated, you know, wouldn't have entered the mentality. How come this woman would have been absolutely outside, whereas, you know, all the other discipline, all the other ideology were penetrated by this. It was impossible not to be penetrated. So that feminism has never wanted to look at its own history because effectively it sees itself also, it see women as being the victim of men. So the domination of men is seen as, you know, the most important one. And therefore, you know, all the other form becomes secondary. So white women who have benefited from, as I, you know, a lot of uh, the privilege that gave, that that history gave them. It's not out of talent or out of, you know, uh, you know, a specific capacity that they, they, they were at the privilege. It's because the, the world in which they live was exploiting and, and uh, you know, uh, and dominating other, other huge part of the, uh, of the other world. And this idea of, uh, superior civilization, superior culture of the right, you know, of a certain understanding of right, totally justify the fact that you ha have to have criminal and the, this criminal deserve prison. This idea of, you know, like the separation between those who are respectable, who are, you know, live a, the good life, and those who do not deserve, you know, protection, those who are not the good father, the good mother, the good man, the good woman, who are, do not have, you know, the, the uh, high civilization or in the high degree and can be punished. It's the idea also about uh, the conception of the order of society that rests on repression and imprisonment and not on, uh, you know, restorative justice, reparative justice, I mean, ideas of peacefulness in the society, but uh, the idea that order, um, the order, social order, uh, must rest, in fact, in separating uh, the good from the bad. But the, the conception of what is good and what conception of what is bad is absolutely historically based. It does not, you know, it's nothing natural that coming from some, you know, other planet. Yeah, and I think that idea of exploitation, domination, repression, but all the while kind of preaching these values of freedom and liberation, like, I think you're absolutely right that that continues kind of in the way that carceral feminism frames itself. And I was wondering in the book, you know, you talk about, um, on the note of freedom, you talk about the relationship between neoliberalism and carcerality. And I wondered if you could speak to that relationship, how, how do they interact? Yeah, I mean, uh, neoliberalism at, at this uh, at this way of uh, of uh, playing on different level at the same time, you know, like uh, saying one thing and something else, you know, like uh, at the same time, yeah. And so um, because it want the, to to remain in uh, to to preserve domination has to play on different level, right? But neoliberalism really plays first, you know, on the question of the individual freedom. I mean, the, the, really the individual, there is no collectivity. We have to crush everyone around us to be, you know, to be on top. 
rests also on, on understanding of, uh, of the naturalness of domination. Some people can do it because if you were making some effort, you know, if you were doing what you should do, you will not be poor. And so poverty is your own, uh, it's of your own device, you know, you have, as if you have chosen. It's erased the question of, you know, conflict. It's erased the way, you know, it, by transforming everything into individual, the, you know, the responsibility of the individual, of course, it erased the fact that these are fabricated uh, uh, inequalities and injustice. These are not, you know, in, uh, uh, according to difference in characters, they are absolutely fabricated and organized uh, and, and uh, re reproduce, constantly reproduce uh, through uh, discourse, through practices, through laws, uh, the constant reproduction of inequality of injustice, but also a naturalization of this injustice and inequality, you know, to make us that, to, to educate us not to see them as inequality, but that the world, you know, that the way the world goes, that, you know, this is impossible, but if these people, if the global south is poor and they develop, it's also their own fault. Look at their leaders, they are corrupted, and look as, you know, the French president say, look at this woman in Africa, they are having too many children, so this is why you have poverty. And this was, say, you know, last year. So th this, this, um, this has not disappeared. You know, under the language of individual freedom, of the, of the fact that you, we can, I can reinvent myself every day, I have like total freedom, then in fact, is a constant reproduction of inequality and injustices and, 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 the, and for the, that class, race, and gender base. Yeah, and on that note of kind of saying one thing but then doing another and by doing that kind of making certain inequalities seem natural. I was interested in, in that chapter, you kind of talk about um, securitization um, and the idea that kind of this artificial concept of safety can often put racialized people in danger. And you give one example of on a kind of prestigious college campus, how there's kind of all these this campus security, which is supposed to make students seem safe, but actually there are a lot of students that are made unsafe by that. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that concept, kind of securitization and surveillance. How does that shape our ideas of what kind of violence is acceptable? Yeah, thank you. Violence? It's a very important question because I'm constantly struck by the accumulation of discourse about safety, protection, and you know, more surveillance, more camera will make us, you know, feel safer, and with more police in the subway or everywhere, it's going to be make safer. And all this constant and draws soon, you know, and all this to make us suffer. And then we are living in, a, in an increasingly hostile environment. I mean, the city itself, you know, are hostile. You know, it's hostile to young men, to young black men, and you know, young Arab and young Asian. Uh, you know, hostile to sex workers, to queers, to gay, to, to you know, to, to women workers, you know, to the cleaning woman, hostile to, to elderly, you know, will not find the kind of transportation or, you know, it's a very, it's, this our city made for, you know, 50, 40 year uh, young old uh, uh, white man, you know, uh, wealthy and who can run from one place to the other and do you know, their, their run in the morning. I mean, the kind of like body, performing body of health, you know, that in fact is, is made possible because of the exploitation of so many other body that made that, you know, healthy body uh, possible. And so uh, um, this, uh, uh, it's that constant construction of the hostile environment, you know, is uh, it make effectively the life of, of all these other people vulnerable and fragile. I, I mean, we do know, I'm young, young men, you know, black and Arab, know that there are some neighborhood that are forbidden to them. It's not written at the entry of the neighborhood, but they do know, you know, that they will not, they will not enter freely. They don't circulate freely. And neither, you know, uh, uh, many other groups. So, the, uh, and the 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 the, uh, the discourse of freedom, and we see how the word freedom is constantly used by the far right and by the conservative. You know, like it's becoming the most important word for them. We, you know, the freedom of 
of doing whatever they want, that freedom is in fact increasingly, you know, repression uh, for uh, so many other people because it's the freedom of, you know, white supremacy. And, and, and thus, you know, it's through that freedom of white supremacy, it's really the, 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 the world they, they, they build for being, you know, being able to circulate is a world that can be only hostile to these uh, other people. It's, and uh, um, it's, it's, it's more, and I mean, all this question for protection, we know is constantly racially, you know, it, there is a racial difference. You know, we saw, we are seeing recently, we saw recently the, you know, refugee in Europe, how you made a difference between the good refugee and the bad refugee. You know, those who had to be accepted and welcome, which is, of course, we have to welcome refugees, but those who could not even cross the border. And even when they cross the border, I mean, the Black and Arab students, you know, who were in Ukraine, even when they were able to cross the border after a lot of difficulty, they were not received in, you know, uh, equally in the other part. So that constant we see every day that the protection, the, the, the discourse and the practice of protection are not universal. There is not universal right for protection. It depends on your skin color, it depends on your, you know, of, of your class, it depends on your gender, it depends on many things. And even among women, when because you know this idea of protect, protecting women and children, it depends. Not all women and not all children are protected. That is not true. So we, we need to show that, um, that uh, politi these politics of protection and, uh, are in fact absolutely not, you know, not universal and are based, based really deeply based, you know, racially based and uh, class based. That's, that's absolutely uh, uh, clear. So there is, um, there is really, in fact, more protection mean, mean practically more threat to uh, racialize uh, people because the protection for the few is based on the fact that the, 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 the many will be criminalized because they historically constitute a threat to the few. And therefore the few to be protected more and more you know, walls, barbed wires on the borders, you know, but and within the city, uh, different, you know, the segregation and racial and social segregation, because then this, these people have to be pushed away from the center of the city, have to be pushed away from the country behind the border. So the small world, you know, will be protected, but what is protected is, you know, supremacy and, uh, and the wealth that has been uh, acquired uh, through exploitation and extraction. Absolutely. And I just want to remind people to please be thinking about your questions and pop them in the chat because we will be opening up to audience questions in a bit. Um, and then Francoise, I mean, I was thinking it, it's kind of a theme coming up, this thing of, you know, saying one thing in theory, but another thing operates in practice. And I was thinking about how you're saying kind of in practice, racialized people, racialized women, you know, are often the people who are harmed by these ideas of safety. But that was making me think about the way that you discuss in the book sex work and debates around sex work in France in the 1980s and often sex worker exclusionary or sex worker abolitionist um, feminists would kind of conjure up this image, right, of the migrant sex worker who needed to be saved. Um, and I was interested in why do you think carceral feminists draw on this idea of save, saving the marginalized woman? Um, and how does that actually play out in practice? Mm. Mm. I will say, okay, this made me think, I mean, perhaps different thing. I mean, the white saviorism, you know, the white savior uh, syndrome. So of course, um, these women are victim of traffic and we're gonna save them. Uh, we don't, uh, so these feminists will not look at the cause and the reason of trafficking and uh, why the, for instance, a woman will, will believe what 
is offered to them. They, you know, it's, oh, come to Italy or France or you know UK because you you will, will find your job. And so they are seen as big team, as as naive, you know, as is some form of credulity. But then why? Why could I mean? Do you imagine the condition, their condition of living? Do, do you have any idea of what and why this condition are that? You know, why made that con this condition possible? The constant domination, the support of corrupted leaders, the fact that, you know, I mean, all of this effectively absolutely unfair world. And also the fact that the the condition of living of many of, of these people, the, the, the pollution, the contamination of the place, you know, and what do they see? Why is Europe protected? Like Europe is protected. Europe has been able to protect itself from a lot of, you know, uh, of, of this external uh, threat. I mean, of this threat that, that, that Europe is producing, I mean, the West, not just Europe, but also North America, elsewhere. I mean, the fact that extraction will bring pollution, contamination, and people have to flee. You know, people are fleeing poverty, are fleeing pollution, are fleeing climate disaster. And they come to a place that has been able to protect itself, most, you know, mostly from that, even though it's going to come, but until now it's protected. So through that, you know, they, they, this is uh, uh, that, that constant meaning of, um, I mean, that that constant construction of uh, who deserves protection and who does not deserve protection. Um, the question also for me, you know, if you do remember in the book, I also want to say that violence, of course, against women is absolutely, uh, um, I mean, the, the greatest, I mean, the greatest, fight. there is a war against women in the world today, you know, there, there is incredible, I mean, we see it femicide and dismembering and torture. But we should not, I mean, the, the, the violence on the body is not just against women, it's also more and more against men of, of, of color in, in the global south. And the fact that rape is becoming also, is no longer, a, uh, I mean, the, is not against women, which of course it's massively against women, but also more and more against men. And so what does that mean? What, how do we understand that? You know, how do we understand that in Iraq, you know, in Abu Rahib, in the prison, but also in Congo, in uh, Myanmar and uh, in the prison and the army, why, what's happening? You know, how do we understand that? And that for me, these are the questions I wanted you know, to understand and not just to remain on the surface of things, of, uh, you know, of also a, a, a form of indignation that, that I understand, but that does not uh, explain uh, to me, you know, how it's work, how, you know, what triggered all this. Uh, um, so th that was, th this were for me also, um, um, you know, um, how cultural feminism is playing a role, uh, not only, of course, in, in, in the country where it's emerged, but globally as, um, as justifying a carceral system that is not just on here where, where the feminists are, I mean, the carceral feminists are acting, but also globally, making the entire world a prison uh, for so many people. And a prison, which is for me not just the prison, I mean, the walls, of course, which are of, uh, uh, the most terrible, you know, but also the prison of, of poverty, the prison of permanent war, the prison of occupation, of colonial occupation, um, you know, that, that, that form of like uh, uh, making the life uh, narrow, you know, that there is no horizon, there is no possibility uh, of... Uh, of, of the idea that you know there would be a future, uh, fabricating futureless future, and how this you know to escape that, and cultural feminism for me contribute to that futureless future, that creation of futureless future. Thank you. And um, on that idea of kind of building futures and how we imagine and kind of practically how how we do that. I was just thinking about, I think it comes up a bit in both of your books, this idea of, you know, there are plural feminisms and struggles that take place within feminism um, and amongst feminists. And why do you think it's important that we do hold on to 
feminism under that umbrella kind of as a political project? That's a good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> Uh, Sometimes I wonder, you know, like is this, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, as I explained, you know, uh, in my, in the former book, for a long time, I did not call myself a feminist because of that, you know, because of the association with uh, uh, white supremacy in Europe, you know, and colonialism and the complicity of many, many, many European feminism in, you know, uh, colonization in feminism. So I was thinking, well, that's not... But then uh, there were two things, you know, that the capture by the far right, the fact that everyone can be feminist. And so thinking how capitalism, especially neoliberalism, is able to uh, appropriate and transform into commodity, even what it's critic, you know, what, even the critique against capitalism become a commodity, you know, and the commodification of everything, you know, every revolt and how you quell a revolt, how you pacify revolts through or through this appropriation, this commodification. So how to fight against that commodification and how to continue to give content, a revolutionary content to a world, right? So you have state feminism, you have femina feminism, you have, in, you know, femo imperialism, you have all the, you know, but, and corporate feminism and all this, but then you have black feminism, Islamic feminism, queer feminism, you know, feminism in the South, and this, I think, and indigenous feminism, and they deserve to be uh, effectively because they, they still carry, I mean, they carry a, a radical dimension. When uh, the indigenous feminists in Central America said no decolonization without depatriarchalization, they offer again, you know, some kind of that they would be, you know, that they connect the two things, as, you know, many other uh, feminists of the global south or, you know, in minority in the north have made. So I, um, because you, we know they appropriate everything. They have a appropriate queerness. They have appropriate, you know, they have, you know, decolonial theory. I mean, everything. So it's so either we we are left with no words, you know, and and okay, let's invent, but you know, we're inventing, inventing, or we fight against that commodification, and we constantly remind, you know, like oh, oh what they, you know, they are suddenly they have become anti-racist, but the anti-racism is a form of racism, you know, it's neoliberal anti-racism, you know, and their feminism remain, in fact, uh, uh, you know, state feminism or transforming women's right into one of the best weapon of imperialism. So I will say um, that for any struggle we have is a constant, uh, uh, clarifying the content of, uh, of the word uh, we use and the, the horizon we have, you know, of, of the struggle we live. Uh, because effectively we can become totally uh, uh, frustrated and, and even in despair, uh, you know, confronted with the speed uh, uh, with which they absolutely quell revoked, you know. Uh, through commodification, through even glamour. I mean, I don't know in the UK, but in France, for instance, everything, you know, suddenly there was an African season, you know, Africa became suddenly, you know, the most glamorous things, uh, uh, you know, in France. And, uh, and in the meantime, uh, there was, you know, military intervention, French military intervention in Mali, or, you know, still um, exploitation and extraction. So it's, uh, yeah. It's a constant clarification. Yeah, I'm really spurred on by that idea as well of like, because when it becomes a thing of constantly disavowing and disavowing, abandoning, and like you say, yes. trying to recreate things every time, um, yes. it leaves you without language. Um, yeah, it leaves us without language, but also the, uh, you're right, but, but, but by pushing us constantly to invent something, they, ca they catch us also into their economy, you know, advertisement economy of constantly finding the next formula that will sell something, you know. And uh, so we have to remain true. Um, you know, dignity is, uh, is a very important notion that mobilizes people throughout the world, you know. And, and there is something when people war, you know, march in the street or rebel for dignity and respect and, and liberty that in freedom, it's, it's still, you know, uh, uh, there is something that they cannot capture, 
because even though they put you know on on the on the on the walls of their official buildings um and so appropriated well pe people will still will march in the street for freedom you know because the freedom they are talking about is not the freedom that people want absolutely and now we've got some questions from the audience. Um, so the first question is from Socialist Feminism for the 21st Century. And it is, would you please comment on Putin's invasion of Ukraine and the responsibilities of feminists in expressing solidarity with the Ukrainian resistance? Okay. Well, um, I would say for, uh, I mean, uh, for uh, the, the feminist I side with is um, it will be the feminists who, uh, who pronounce themselves against the war, but don't fall into uh, the defense of NATO and the militarization, you know, the increasing militarization of Europe. Um, uh, the war, I mean, Europe has been, of course, shocked by that war, but Europe should remember that war has been waged for decades in many other parts of the world. This is not what about, you know, it's not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that <clears throat> war has been a permanent state for so many people. So what we have as feminists to uh, fight against is a, a, the state of permanent war. There is a state of permanent war constantly constantly and effectively now it's in, a, in it's in Ukraine and uh, so uh, we have uh, as feminists you know any war is about rape is about torture murder and devastation and destruction there is no war you know it's inseparable from that from trauma and suffering and exile you know and and I, I would say that um, uh, for me, for instance, is to to uh, to how to make to bring an hand to that state of permanent war, how to fight against militarization. Uh, I always, uh, before even the war, you know, I reminded a lot of people in France that France is the third, is the second now, uh, producer and seller of weapon in the world, and if you sell weapon, you sell war. There was, I mean, you don't sell weapon for anything else, right? So how do we, as uh, if we live in Europe as feminists in Europe, we put a hand to that, you know, we put an hand. And then you will tell me, yes, but Putin is using so should we not, you know, arm people. Of course, uh, uh, fighting for peace does not mean uh, being passive. It's also finding, you know, how we organize self-defense and when we take arms to defend ourselves or to uh, defend ourselves against the invasion. But I have been, uh, I have to say that um, the incredible unanimity uh, of Europe suddenly discovering war, you know, and the fact that uh, the, the treatment of refugee, the rationalized uh, difference, you know, uh, among refugee has for me uh, uh, been an, uh, again, I was not surprised. I cannot say I was surprised at all, but was again, you know, uh, effectively revealing what is at the heart of, you know, of nonetheless the construction of a Russian Europe, you know, um, that, uh, and that for me it's, it's, uh, has been a question. So it's not, you know, what about the war elsewhere, but what about that war in Europe reveal about both uh, what is Russia, but also what is, Europe. I mean, assert that Europe, the, that Europe, that uh, uh, that thought, you know, that it was. Uh, oh, they are like us because they are blonde and blue eyes, and we have to, you know, welcome them because they look like us. They they they, they watch the same thing that we are, and that, that was for me the reconstruction of you know the civilized world versus the uncivilized world. And so I see it as, as of course, the, you have the emergency, you have the urgent things that you do that, you know, uh, effectively stopping the war and um, uh, welcoming refugees and, uh, and also fighting again the afterlives of the war because war leave behind it. Uh, you know, it's not because when, if, when there will be, you know, the end of war that they will, it will be the, really the end of war. So it was very important question, uh, you know, every war, and um, 
And then the, the question of um, Putin itself and, and the question of Russia will perhaps demand a much longer uh, discussion about that, uh, that, uh, that who uh, effectively of, a, of um, the reconstruction of the world after uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and after 9-11. And the redistribution and the shift, I mean, this we will enter uh, what is called, you know, geopolitics, but uh, what I call effectively how you, the world order and how this is constructed and reconstructed constantly. And I think it's an important uh, debate, but I'm not sure well, we will have time for that. But I, what I mean by that is I don't want to jump into, you know, just the, the, the question of uh, condemning the war. I want also to understand what is bringing uh, I'm not in, I mean, I'm in France right now, but I've not been living in France. I'm living in another part of the world where I see the shift brought by this war, uh, how it will affect, for instance, Africa, you know, how Africa will be deeply affected. Uh, it's already affected by the fact that wheat is not being exported and that therefore, you know, the entire people are on the, on the brink of famine in Egypt, Algeria and Senegal. And of course, so the, the raising cost of oil is also has an incredible meaning for the continent of Africa. So I'm looking also as a, what effectively how one man, you know, it's absolutely bringing incredible shift and a lot of people will be are suffering and will be suffering. And my duty as an anti-racist decolonial feminist is to look at all this impact and effect. Thank you, Francoise. Um, another question, uh, I think you've spoken to this a bit, but I think you, you'll have more to say, is um, when we think of sexual violence, we often think of women as the victims of this. How can this anti-carceral fem feminist approach be used to examine when men are victims of sexual violence? Mm, yeah, sure, sure. Well, as I say, Paul, I was in... Uh, I was interested in all the report I read, you know, by the CIA, but all those so of this massive, you know, now how to rape is massively used, you know, against men, and also all the violence against trans, against queer. There is, uh, this is what I was trying to do in that book, showing that violence is systemic, absolutely systemic, is structural, structural to the capitalism and racism. Women are the most uh, fabricated, are the most uh, vulnerable, are, are really the target of the greatest violence. But men and children, and uh, among children, boys, are also effectively massively victim of, of uh, violence and sexual violence. We can think about, you know, all the, the, the boys that uh, Outside, I mean, boys uh, uh, in community or indigenous community or community of color who were sent to orphanage and are still sent. I mean, incredibly effectively. There is, I will say, um, the the way the world is structured by violence. I mean, the, the, as I say, you know that you cannot have capitalism extraction and exploitation without violence. It's not possible. It's not possible. So you're gonna exercise the effectively violence and not of course massively against women, massively, but also against men. And um, the fact uh, how, uh, so for, for me will be uh, to address that question of uh, transformation of bodies into bodies that are um, used and abused, uh, that become object of uh, and where, uh, regardless of uh, that gender, sometimes, but become object of uh, in the end of uh, of uh, effectively um, dominant people do, uh, in in the situation of domination, and they could be women. In fact, I mean, remember that uh, in Abu Ghraib, uh, it was a woman soldier, U.S. woman soldier, who who, who rape. Uh, the, the, the prisoner, the male prisoners. So yes, uh, this question, and as I, um, um, of, of uh, transforming even male bodies in bodies that can be uh, violently penetrated. Um, and and, and uh, so, uh, 
the fact that the, pen the violent penetration of bodies, uh, regardless of gen and gender, is uh, this is a proof uh, through which domination is um, is exercised. Uh, no, that's not a very clear sentence. Is a is a is a is a way uh, violence is more directly exercised on the body. Uh, um, your right is a very important uh, uh, question. Um, sexual violence as um, uh, first against uh, uh, women and children, and um, and also, but as I say, um, neo uh, neoliberal capitalism and racism transform all bodies into bodies. Uh, to penetrate violently and sexually abuse. Yeah, and I agree. It's so important to make that visible and and to to actually speak to that because I mean I think it's a thing that abolitionist feminists are talking about increasingly. Right, this idea yeah. that um, when you say that violent men should go to prison, like we know prisons are huge sites of sexual violence for men. Um, that's something that's that's commonly known. Um, yeah, it seems. And, and, you know, Michelle, I'm always surprised. You know, when people are, you know, when I hear women send them to prison, is as if they have never been to a prison. They have never been to a place that is where you destroy. It's a place of destroying. You know, mentally, psychically, and and body destruction is is uh, this are absolutely site of pure torture. You know. Uh, you isolate people. You, uh, we know that human beings need social. You know, need to be social. Also, we are social. You know, and you are, you really break uh, people. You break their mind. You break their body. And for me, it's absolutely it's 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 a um, legitimate torture. Yeah, we've got another question, um, which is. Uh, Hello, I was curious if you could talk a bit more about the connection between carceral feminism generally and the rise of the female right-wing French politician. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the rise of a right-wing um, woman politician in France is also connected uh, with uh, in resolve uh, colonial past of France. Uh, it's very much. I mean, the the friend they imagine is a friend that were, that would still be, you know, at the head of empire. The uh, the far right in France is directly the child of uh, French Algeria. You know, uh, whether you look at the National Front or at uh, Zemmour, they are really the children of uh, fascist French Algeria. We we often forget the colonial roots of fascism. We do think, you know, fascism was just born in Europe, but they are, they are colonial roots to fascism. So there is this, um, uh, this genealogy connected with a form of a colonial fascism, which is virilist, you know, which is masculinist, which is racist, which is xenophobic and anti-Semitic deeply, you know, they, it was deeply, deeply anti-Semitic. And so this, this is one genealogy, and the other one is effectively uh, this idea of a, a form, you know, of patriarchal order, uh, and the patriarchal order, even you know, with effectively uh, this woman, this woman in the far right are for patriarchy, you know, and uh, and it's this idea of order exercised through uh, uh, through form of you know uh, um, punishing everyone in the society that do not obey the norm of, you know, order and, and uh, yeah, of a certain order. So the two connection with, uh, I mean, the, the carceral, I mean, the, how can I say, uh, carceral ideology has also a connection with, uh, with colonial, you know, the colonial uh, uh, regime, prison, uh, the police and prison were also very, uh, Tested in that was a little you know ignored by the by by Foucault who remain a very important reference in the thinking about uh, the prison, but there was a uh, we usually forget 
the connection with Colonia. So what I mean, I mean to, to, to be clear, is like the far right in, in France and the women far right have, you know, are connected with that history, history which both feed a certain fascism, anti-Semitic, anti you know, racist, anti-Arab, you know, uh, form of nationalism. And then connected also with the, the colonial regime of incarceration. That uh, uh, colonial uh, power was exercised through effectively criminalizing uh, the colonized, uh, as uh, Franz Fanon has shown, and uh, and also and, and uh, remember also what Fanon said in um, the Algerian Revolution, no, the African Revolution, is in chapter on the, um, the veil woman, that one of the uh, colonial policy. I mean, one of the colonial the colonial policy about women was get the woman and the rest will follow. And in a way, carceral feminism is with that, you know, how do you separate also some women from the community, right? That you show that the men of this community are dangerous or threat, you know, to, and then you bring that and so you weaken uh, the, the, the revolt of the community. You separate women and men by saying that you are uh, the victim of your of the men of your community and of your people, and we will protect you. So, carceral, uh, uh, the far right carceral uh, far right, uh, women in in France have uh, are connected with that history, which is of course still present. I mean, um, when I say story, it's not just because, you know in the past, past, past. Uh, France has not yet um, with you know not yet. Um, look at its colonial past. It's transforming it into some form of memory and that was sound and we should condemn it. And even, you know, the, the current president is ready to, you know, condemn, you know, the uh, excess of, you know, domination, because then you don't look at the, the way in which uh, at the afterlives of slavery to, to use the art man expression and, you know, the way it's still structure the society today. It's not the past, it's still, you know, a present. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I've got another question from Leah, which is, what harm is done to our resistance movements by campaigns for carceral solutions to feminist issues? For example, in the UK, attempts to make misogyny a hate crime or to criminalize mm -hmm. street harassment? Mm -hmm. That's very, yeah, very good question. Yeah. Yeah, very, very good, good question, yes. It's a, perhaps it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's connected with me with this transformation of uh, women's right um, into um, um, uh, right. Um, I mean, again, this, this question of protection um, rather than, than really transformation. Um, so effectively, for instance, in France, you have a law against uh, sexual harassment in the street. And of course, you understand that we're going to be targeted right away. Um, there are, um, uh, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's uh, the parents are making misogyny a crime or making, you know, even some form of sexual harassment a crime. It's transformed, you know, a, a question of a structural uh, discrimination and structural uh, inequality into a question that is, you know, against more protection for women, you know. And that this protection is not, of course, at first, not before all women to begin with. And, you know, a state that is itself the one that produce violence and that produce sexism and discrimination becoming the protector, you know, it's effectively, we, we could, you know, be a little concerned. So it's, it's that's, our, uh, that's what carceral feminism, you know, all this uh, punishing feminism, you know, the feminism which look at punishment and in fact very, you know, in a very bourgeois, uh, way, you know, against those who threaten, you know, the, the proletarian, the black, the world, you know, the Arab, the brown, the, you know, the Asian, the Muslims, and everyone. It's really uh, if it, to protect, us, uh, in fact, the social order as it is. So making misogyny, for instance, a crime, it's of course as if misogyny is something that is individually a crime, you know, that, uh, okay, oh, that person, you know, like, as, as, you know, like a, 
And so we will punish that person uh, rather than looking at misogyny as structuring, uh, you know, the social order uh, that, uh, that has been put in place by bourgeois, uh, you know, bourgeois capitalism and uh, the bourgeois family, you know. Uh, and um, and it's 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 make it's a form of um, yeah it's 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 really um, uh, masking uh, all the conflicts, social and you know uh, different conflicts. In the preceding book, you know, for instance, when I read the question "Who cleaned the world?" and and for instance, I was looking also at the way in which mainstream feminism has transformed, you know, the question of cleaning into you know that uh, well, my husband does not do the laundry, right? And we should share the, you know, the laundry duties. And in ignoring the fact that if that what cleaning the world is made by women of color, mass slavery throughout the world, and that they are exploited and they are, you know, discriminated against. And uh, so it's this displacement of a question that is structural into an individual question. And, uh, and that is effectively, um, in the way it harm, uh, you know, uh, it harm uh, uh, the true emancipation, and it masks the the question that would be much more dangerous uh, for the order, right? For the for the current order, because misogyny, you know, if you look at misogyny as if this is something that is expressed by one person to another person, this is absolutely, you know, has nothing to do with misogyny. This, you know, like the, the question of, uh, of getting out of misogyny will not be, of course, addressed by criminalizing. But the criminalization of, of, what, of, um, of what is structural to society is very important to avoid effectively asking, uh, fighting the structure, you know, questioning the structure. You criminalize. Uh, Rape, you criminalize the, you know, discrimination, but you don't address the structure that made them. So then it's become the, the question of one person, right? And one man or one woman with the being. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Angela Davis spoke to this idea the other week um, in a talk she was giving of like, you know, say if misogyny is criminalized, you you try to find a misogynist over here and find another one over there and you arrest this misogynist and that was, but you, 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 you'll yeah, never be done. One then, after one, <laughs> one after one, so what, you're gonna catch two out of a thousand, right? Exactly, exactly. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, maybe a good one to close on would be yeah. on this question from Sam Hanks, which is carceral logics are so embedded. How might these be challenged, and what alternative? Oh, and alternatives offered. Alternative to carceral, yeah, system, right? Yes. Well, um, well, uh, you know, uh, I, I absolutely on the side of abolitionist feminists, and that uh, that's my uh, one answer. That's not my only answer, but that we dare, we have to dare to imagine a world without prison. We need to imagine that because like we're first, at the first reaction, you know, when I talk about that, people say, but so, uh, you know, the, the, the men who have murdered the little girl, what do you do with them? You know, so there is a, a um, we cannot, I mean, we, we have a right away obstacle to that possibility, you know, like right away, we cannot imagine it because right away. So this is very important because there are so many mechanisms for which we cannot imagine alternative. You know, that it, uh, practically alternatives are made impossible to imagine, you know, uh, because right away, this has always been like that, this is too difficult, but what about this and what about that? So I do think what abolitionist feminists, you know, uh, uh, tell us to do is to, to dare to imagine that possibility. And from that possibility, then to see how we're going to work, you know, how we can answer to these different things. Because if we start to say, oh, there is it, there is that, then what, what are, you know, we will not be able to imagine, right? So that projection into the future, that possibility, the fact that the same, in the same way that the enslaved say, one day we will be free, 
you know, and it lasted century. They had to fight for a century, but they never abandoned the idea that one day there would be freedom. And we know that they still fight because abolitionism, abolition has not been complete. But that possibility, so I will start to say by that, you know, these things. That is, uh, and then there are alternatives, of course, of, you know, restorative justice by indigenous community, uh, you know, um, um, uh, non-prison, you know, like more, more possibility, but reforming prison is not abolishing prison. And that, you know, making prison more human is another way of effectively keeping prison. So I would say also, um, also creating more uh, community-based form of protection. And that we, we, are, we have example, you know, in the township of South Africa, in the, in the poor neighborhood of uh, South America, in the favelas of, you know, people fighting again, the way in which violence has penetrated the community, how racism has made you know, penetrated and how you have to effectively almost take that poison out of the community and imagine ways of protecting and how do you deal with the you know, violence within. So there are many examples right, or, or right away of community refusing to call the police right away and to effectively make, you know, calling to uh, 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 justice system, which they know is deeply racist and classist. So we need to, to continue to, 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 to develop this to, uh, and also to, I uh, will say education, education, speaking, really speaking when crime happen and discussing them and not being afraid. Uh, uh, I, I say in my book that for instance, uh, you know, uh, women, uh, I mean, activists who have worked with, with women who, who were victim of rapes, and the uh, rapist was a judge. They quite often they were not necessarily wanted to send the guy to to jail. What they wanted it was a form of recognition, and they did not feel uh, that the, the 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 tribunal has given them justice because they knew that by sending that man to prison will not you know will not transform you know that will not uh, change the structure of violence. So it's a very, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, fighting, educating against um, what has been, uh, is constantly shown even through movies, series, as you have the right to take revenge and brutal revenge about brutal crime. You know, all the cinema is showing uh, that and all the series. So there answer to violence and you have to answer through self-defense and when do you have to do violence so i would say education is also very important you know educating ourselves and, and discussing about uh, uh, how to um uh, you know and so and how to answer to to constant aggressivity and stress that is part of the of our daily life and that effectively push us to uh, uh, to say, oh, I, I can, you know, uh, how there is also a fabrication of um, of a situation in which in which I was self want to, I want I I want to feel safe. I I want to to be I want to be quiet, you know, and this, and so that uh, lock them up, you know, like if, if these people were not there, you know, it would be. It, it will, the, the world would be more quiet and safer. But that is a it's fabrication because, you know, the, the problem will not disappear. So it's a constant, I will say, education, uh, uh, continuing to, um, to practice a different form of, uh, of justice that indigenous community or black community or, you know, community of color are, are proposing. Um, and really uh, taking abolitionism seriously. Really, 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 really. Uh, that's uh, very important. It's not going to be tomorrow, uh, but it has, it has, it, 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 if we really make it in, a, you know, a very important thing in our mind, uh, that will force us to think, to read, and to imagine. 
Absolutely. And I think that idea of imagination and prefiguration is so important to hold on to and so radical, this idea that yeah. actually what if we could and let's uh, try and act as if we could today. Yeah, yeah you're so right, Misha, because uh, um, the way the world is made, it restricts our imagination. You know, uh, it really restricts, it's narrower and narrower, you know, and so we have to reappropriate the power of imagination. We have to like exercise. We have to exercise ourselves, you know. Let's imagine if we were imagine, you know, and really imagine in the sense of imagining, not just, uh, you know, uh, and that are, you know, exercising, uh, yeah, collective exercise of imagining a future. Mm -hmm. And I did realize there was one final thing that I wanted to ask you, but I'm aware we're almost out of time. So maybe if you could just give a closing remark on a very big question, which is what does a truly radical anti-imperialist decolonial feminism look like? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. It's not, it's first not, never take something as, uh, oh, this is the way it goes. Always being curious. It's an endless curiosity. Things are, you know, uh, the world around us uh, is uh, made by uh, human. It's a choice by some of them. So we can undo this choice and make other. Um, it's constantly trying to understand what is becoming, not taking things, you know, as, oh, this is the way they are. Um, being aware of that, if, that uh, you know, uh, the incredible conflict between uh, the, those who exercise domination and those who are dominated. Um, trusting, trusting, deeply trusting um, the fight, the struggle of people everywhere, that uh, all the time people are fighting everywhere in uh, in terrible situation, there is always fighting, learning uh, from this fight, and really, really, really learning that, you know, and also learning about the ancestors, that uh, thanks to them, to their dreams, uh, we are still there and we are still dreaming. Thank you so much. That's all we have time for, but I think that's such a fantastic note to end on. Um, thank you to Pluto for hosting us tonight. Yeah. And thank you so much, Francoise, for an incredibly interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, and finally, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. There should be more information in the chat as to where you can buy Francoise's books. Um, and I hope you enjoyed our discussion tonight as much as I did. And hope you have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you.